We're in this series that's inspired by Keitel Eidelman. It's called End of Me, and it highlights some of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Today, as Rachel said, we're looking at the sixth statement from Jesus, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, there's something that we've had to deal with over the last year. I'm going to call it mask management. Prior to COVID, virtually none of us gave a thought to wearing a mask unless we were in some form of healthcare uh, profession, but now we can't escape it. I ask the question, where am I going? Do I have one with me? Who is going to be there because I need to be protective of them? Do I need to mask up for them? Ladies, ladies, you can now ask the question, should I wear lipstick or not? Do I need to? Guys, it's do I need to shave? I mean, I will confess that sometimes I feel like I'm faking it. And just to be honest... Sometimes I wear a mask, not because I want to. I hope that's not too honest for you. Sometimes it's just, I love you, I want to be with you, and if this lets me be with you, I'm, I'm in. If it keeps you safe, why wouldn't I? But I simply can't pretend to like it. I'm just being honest. Now, sometimes I feel like I'm faking it. I feel like it's just to do it for whatever reason. Sometimes it's just, I want you to let me in. Now, wait, there, there are times when I like a mask. For instance, when I walk into a restroom after some of our staff members have been in there for a period of time, it's, there's like this false sense of security I have wearing the thing. It doesn't help with some of the issues, but it does help me. And wearing a mask can help me hide my facial expressions, which sometimes is a good thing. Like when someone says something that frustrates me or I disagree with, I can hide the smirk or the frown or whatever. Uh, And and even a mask, it can kind of work like a muzzle. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but so, you know, if I'm a mumbler sometimes and sometimes someone says something, I go, they say, oh, what? Oh, uh, then you say whatever you shouldn't have, you know, should have said, but didn't. But... Am I being too transparent about this? Is some of you, you're like, I might, have, I might have angered you because this has been a volatile issue for some of us. You, we probably had a heated discussion or two about should we or shouldn't we or why do we or why don't we? And I understand that. I understand that this isn't an easy issue. I hope you heard me say earlier, I love you. I hope that gives me some cred with you. But look, here's the thing in the bigger picture. We've all worn masks, every one of us. And beyond this corona mask, I'm just going to call it faking it. You know what that is. You do it. So do I. Because we are so concerned about what other people think about us or how we're perceived that that oftentimes we will mask ourselves. And and by the way, Kyle Eidelman talks about this, how social media is a huge masking mechanism. He says that it plays into our preoccupation with the opinions of others, how we want people to see us. And he says, let's say you go on vacation with your family and there's certain things you post and there's things you don't. Picture of the happy family on the beach, post it. Fighting in the car on the way to the beach, never gets posted. Right? You post... Date night with hubby. And there's this picture of the two of you longingly looking in each other's eyes. And of course, there's the humble caption you add to that that says, married way up. But nobody posts the Monday morning picture of two grumpy people snarling, her in hair curlers, him with shaving cuts, neither talking and both needing space. The habit of faking it is so ingrained in us that most of the time we don't even know when we're doing it. Because we are conditioned to be as impressive as possible in the settings that we want to impress. And so what happens is we kind of hide behind this fake version of the real me. And we want everyone to like us. And we, we, we want everyone to accept us. And we do this with faith. 
We do it with politics. Now, I understand that's a vulnerable thing to say, and it's risky to say. I'm telling you right now, it's risky. And there's probably a, a lot of reasons for that. One is that we think no one will like us or accept us if we are real, if we're ourselves. And sometimes it's that we just really shouldn't say some things because James tells us we should control our tongues. He says that we got to be careful how we use our words because it's important for us not to wound people with them. The truth is we are not always good at living out Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, 8. Blessed are Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, let's break that down for a minute. What does pure mean? It's really important to understand this. First of all, pure means undiluted. So in the worldly sense, it's that I have a single heart, that my heart beats for God, and then so I don't let the world dilute it. Years ago, I made a batch of my world-famous chili. And I entered a contest. Don't doubt me, by the way. I got second place in the 1988 Arapaho Chili Contest. <laughs> Street cred right there. Now, I wanted to dominate in 1989, so I did some research with friends. I said, what will make this better? Someone said, oh, you're only missing one ingredient, cumin. Okay, so I did it. Ruined it, destroyed it. Don't mess with success. It diluted it. Our souls can become diluted when we mix in the wrong ingredients. In Proverbs 11.20, it says, The Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but he delights in those with integrity. If my heart were pure, it would never be diluted. My heart is not pure, not on my own volition anyway. Neither is yours. Because we allow the world to stir in its ingredients and then it, and it, then it waters us down. It deludes us. Pure also means, not just undiluted, it means unmasked. It means authentic. I don't mask. I don't hide who I am. And that's a big deal. Jesus addressed it face to face with those who eventually crucify him over the issue. Jesus became the fast enemy of a religious group of people called the Pharisees in the first century. These were the church folk. Let's just be honest. They were the religious leaders of the churchy people in that day. They had built the whole religion on appearance. They wore, they literally wore a mask from head to toe. Virtually every movement they made, every decision they made was intended to make them look flawless. They turned following God into a whole system of religious rituals that they needed to perform, and those who performed the most and the best were the most holy, they thought. Now, on the outside, they really looked pretty good. They looked the part. Flowing robes, fancy tassels on their robes, little boxes sewn on their hats and on their garments that had little scripture verses inside of them. The endless rituals, the rules that they performed to prove their piety. And then the Son of God, the perfect one, steps into their world and he starts pointing out things. He starts showing them their deficiencies and where they fall down because they truly weren't pure at heart. And, and, and he said, look, your issue is the heart. And then he even said this. He said, you guys are like graves. You are beautiful on the outside but you're full of death within. And his point is that it works for a while to appear pious. And we see it in church folk today. People who act the part. They use religious works. They use ritual. They use certain clothing standards that they think others should live by. They use symbols on their clothes and their cars and their walls and their arms and their wherever else on their body. They use Jesus jargon. Now, now, again, none of this is bad in itself. It, it's not like that's the issue. The issue more is what's happening inside because they're high on tradition and they're high on perfection, but they're low on authenticity. And if God came to do nothing else, he came to show us how to be real with him. 
The word that Jesus most often uses to challenge that kind of thinking is hypocrisy, being hypocritical, faking it. And we all, look, we all do this to some level. Let's be real. We, we all try to hide at some level behind the false self. And one of the great challenges, I think, for Christians is to not create a false environment that keeps up appearances, but you look inside the person and you find nothing but just dead thinking and dead doing and dead being. One of the beautiful things about groups like Rooted and, and, and I think LBS when it gets to that level, small groups when they get there, is that it's a way for us to get deeper with each other so we can be real with each other and we can find authenticity with people in a safe place where we can actually unmask. And, and it takes time and those of you who are rooted, you're in this process that's just beginning. And so realize it's not going to happen right away but it's not going to happen at all unless you are willing to step into it. And so we find this blessing that Jesus tells us about his upside down kingdom where we can find a pure, a pure heart. We can, and, and it means that we live not in a, you know, in a divided sense where we're deluded and it means we're also being real with each other and that's a lifelong process. But purity also means this, it means unstained. Now this is where we really have an issue. The biblical term is holy. And the fact is that saying Sin, sin stains all of us. It, 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 for us to be unstained, quite simply, we can't do it. We have to be cleansed. That's what the scripture says, that we're made pure. Our hearts are purified by cleansing. In the times of Jesus, the word most often used to describe uh, pure were the terms like metals that were refined or clothing that was, that was laundered or, you know, uh, wheat that was carefully sifted so it was, it was to its best state. It's free from impurity. Here's the issue that we face. It's a human issue that we can't escape. The God who created us is holy, holy. That means he cannot be diluted with anything that's even remotely unholy or impure. Romans 3.10 says we all have this issue. There's no one righteous. No, not, not even one. Unrighteous means that we're unable to have, have intimacy with God because he can't accept us as we are in our sinfulness. And that's really bad news. Because that means our sin is going to ultimately bring death. Sin always results in death. And death comes with a whole gamut of tragedies where beautiful things in our lives die. Like relationships. Or careers. Or the environment that we're killing off. Or our attitudes. Or our health eventually Eventually, our bodies will physically die. And eventually, if not dealt with, if, if we don't let this go a different direction, our souls will die. There's no one righteous. Well, the good news is there's one. And we're here because of him today. His name's Jesus, the one and only. The one who remained undiluted, unmasked, and unstained. He understood our impurity, so he became our purity for us. He understood the issue that we face with our separation from God, so he stepped into the gap, and he bridged the gap with his pure life and his pure actions on our behalf. And so he did this for us. He came. He lived the sinless life. He suffered. He died in our place. He was raised from the dead. He came to purify our hearts so that we can stand with confidence before God, unstained, undiluted, without separation. Hebrews 11, 10, 14 says, By that one offering, Jesus, he forever, Jesus, made perfect those, us, who are being made holy. See the thing, like there's this absolute sense. He did it, and then there's this, proce this process, the sense of process, and now we're being made in a different way. All that I 
can never do to please God, Jesus is for me. Jesus makes me worthy to stand before a holy God, and he continues to work in me to match me up with what that means in life. My life is now inseparably intertwined with God, not by my self-righteousness, but because of his righteousness. Who will see God? Those who are pure in heart. Who are the pure in heart? Those who are being made holy by the precious blood of Christ. Coming to the end of me brings a purity that only he can bring. Jeff Bethke learned that following Jesus came from authenticity. And he paints a real vivid picture of a battle that we face when I listen to me over the voice of God. And Jeff resembles really all of us. Uh, some of you have some of the same life story that he shares. He, he, uh, he lived in a home where there was an absentee father. He tried church, but it was kind of more for show than for anything. Uh, he got into some things as a young man that promised to fill him up, but in the end left him bankrupt. At one point, Jeff's going to say this, we Christians are the only people in the world who are standing doesn't depend on us. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty amazing statement. He rightfully says that to experience freedom, there has to be a sense of vulnerability. And let me just give you a few ideas about how that can be created in your life. And it has to begin with you taking off the mask. The first step to real authenticity is that you become real with God. And, and it starts there. It doesn't start with, you know, some blabbed out confession to people in a small group. It starts with you being real with God, saying, God, I know what I am. And I know without you, I'm nothing. And you've, if you've not put your faith or trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, that's where it starts. And that's the beginning of it. It's time to do that. It's time to repent. It's time to be baptized. It's time to be washed and, and made clean by the blood of Christ. James 4.8 says, come near to God. He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Wash your hands, he says, that, that if you'll do this, that he will give you purity. He'll, he'll help you with your, your life. He'll, he'll change your heart. Now, here's another thing. Cover your heart with his words. I don't mean some kind of fake thing where you like, you know, you quote scriptures all the time because it sounds good to people and makes you look holy. I'm talking about when his word gets into your life. You develop some habits where you're developing your understanding of who God is, especially who Jesus is. In Psalm 1199, the psalmist asks this question, how can a man keep his way pure? And then he answers the question in verse 11, by living according to your word, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you're serious about seeking purity in your life, you got to be serious about knowing what God says to you, what he communicates to you. And his word is the very best way for you to understand that. Here's a third thing. Clamp down on complaining and arguing. Paul says that we exhibit a lack of faith when we are in an argumentative life, when we are in a complaining type of life. Philippians 2 says, do everything without complaining or arguing. Do everything so that you may become blameless and pure. If you want to become something, you've got to probably stop being something. And if you deal, I mean, if this is your spirit right now, and by the way, in America right now, it's pretty rife. If your spirit is complaining, arguing, he says, come pure, come pure. Turn that. Become blameless in that. Here's another thing. Control your eyes. Jeff talked about this in the issue of, of pornography. He, he acknowledged his sin and he allowed the Lord to cleanse his life and, and, he, and that came from him getting off the internet, by the way. If you look at his testimony, you'll see this. Jeff calls our eyes the lamp of the heart. Matthew 6, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. So control what you see. In this culture, it's a very difficult task. 
It requires self-discipline. You have to take control of it. It, it, it. It's seeing your eyes as the conduit, the windows to your soul. That's what the scripture says. Now, let me just give you a thought about that. For years, I have participated in the complaining of people who are watching the Super Bowl halftime show. So I'm sitting there watching the game and all the texts start coming. Oh, did you see that? Blah, 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 blah. And you know, I have to admit, yeah, I did. I saw it. And we all complain about it and talk about how unspiritual it is and all whatever that stuff. And sure, okay. You know what I have found over the last couple of years? That's a great time to go get chips. <laughs> you know, I mean, and then I don't have to listen to it either. I can say, well, you know, I didn't watch. There's something about that. I mean... Linger a while at the nacho bar. Take control. If you're going to watch it, do me a favor. Spare me the text, okay? Just do that. Here, do community with faithful friends. That's another thing. We've already talked about that. But if the people that you're doing life with are filling your life full of stuff that's unholy, unhealthy, and, and painful, and hurtful, and, and unspiritual, that's on you. You've got to change the trajectory of that. And that's why we're offering small group to you, because that's an opportunity for you to build into your life people who think differently than that. And by the way, they're not perfect. You get into small group and you go, oh, I don't think that way. Uh, do they really believe that? I mean, you're going to have all kinds of experiments with that, okay? I'm just telling you, I'm being honest. People are people wherever they gather. But over the long haul, there's an opportunity for you to do life with people who are trying to figure it out. We talked about Celebrate Recovery. We talked about LBS, uh, small groups. Take your small group to a new level by becoming accountable with somebody in the group that you trust and then being real with them. One more thing. This is the long game. Live the long game of, period, of purity. I mean, if you're serious about seeing God, if you're serious about life change, you got to be in it for life and not just a season of life. And there are going to be times when you just get destroyed because you get off track. And the Bible tells us that when we're off track, because we're his, we can confess our sin. He's faithful. He'll forgive us. He'll cleanse us again. He'll do it. It's the long game. The world is still the devil's dominion. Don't bail on God if you make a mistake. Get back in. And most important, keep your eyes focused on what's coming. Because this is a temporary world. No matter how you see it, it's all temporary. It's all going to burn. It's all going to be recreated. 1 John 3.3, 3, this is what it says. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Another way to say that is... I live in constant hope that he who is pure is with me in all of this and he will get me through it. It's an eternal promise. It's not just a temporary one. It's the long game. And he says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. God reserves intimate fellowship with himself to those who are unmixed, unmasked, and who approach this with a purity that says, I know I can't do this myself, God. And it's a continual thing for me to come before your throne and let you do it for me. We come back later and talk a little bit more about that. But as we enter into this time of communion, we do this every week, as you know, if you've been around here. We do this because we, during the week, I mean, we can just get so far off. This is a time when we don't just do some religious activity. This isn't some little religious thing that you do to say, well, I took communion, so therefore. No, that's not what this is. This is a moment where the scripture makes it very clear, where we remember him. We, we recall what it means for him to do what he did for us when he himself became our purity. And how he accomplished that was through the cross, his blood being shed there, the resurrection unto new life. And then we, we look at ourselves and we say, God, is there anything in me that's keeping me from a pure relationship with you? Point it out to me. I confess that to you. Forgive me of that as we go forward. Lord, at this moment, let it be so. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's really amazing to think about, and, and some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have forgotten what I'm going to say. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I want to get there. It is amazing to be free, to, to have just the freedom of accepting who I am, knowing that God accepts me for who I am in terms of the fact that he knows where my heart is, and having a, a clean relationship with him where I have relied on him to overcome my flaws, my impurities, my, my delusions, you know, my masking. He's taken the mask off. He's taken down the veil. He's revealed in the most vulnerable way imaginable his mercy and his grace. But, but for you to, to get to that point or to get back to that point, you have to take off the mask too. And if you do, he says, you will see him. Because God is unmasked. He's white hot there. He's real. And when you finally get to the real you and come to the real end of yourself, you're going to find out that there's a Jesus who's there who will welcome you. And wherever you lack, he'll overcome it. That's the gospel. And that's what he offers you. And don't let it go. Come to the end of yourself and let that begin so you can see God. He wants to see you. Come to him.